morning. The Lord be with you. Welcome to Hope Community United Methodist Church. I want to welcome our viewers that have joined us on Facebook from all kinds of places. And uh, we are happy to have you join us in worship. I do want to tell you that we worship in person here at 5.30 on Saturday nights and 11 on Sunday mornings. And you are invited to come. This is Hope Community United Methodist Church. We're about a block and a half uh, east of Preston and about a block and a half north of Spencer Highway if you want to find us locally. You can also find our website, which is www.hopecommunityumc.org. All of our services are later uh, put online on our Facebook page and on, our, on YouTube and as well as on uh, the website. But this one is live, and so we're glad you're here. I have been asked sometimes by people by email that have joined us online, they said, how can we contribute to the ministries of Hope? You can do that online by simply, you can text, if you will, HCUMC, uh, just the initials, HCUMC 2-206-859-9405. HCUMC to 206-859-9405. Uh, we are approaching Easter. We've got just a few weeks left till Easter, and we'll be decorating the sanctuary with some uh, Easter lilies. There's an envelope like this in the back. If you want to remember someone in your family or someone close to you with an Easter lily, you can do that. You can do it in honor of them if they're still living or in memory if they've gone on to be with God. Um, and the instructions are on the envelope. We welcome those so that we can beautify the sanctuary as we get uh, into this Easter season. The uh, only other reports I have is I have a report on Joe Unger. Just, uh, he's, uh, he's doing okay. He's doing better, I guess is the right word. He had a blood clot in his leg and his lung. And he's uh, uh, being moved to a different floor at the hospital where they can better treat him for his different blood issues. Other than that, I think we're ready to get started. Oops. Shoes. We are still collecting shoes, and we will be collecting them until Palm Sunday. Uh, shoes go for kids that uh, are living in the CPS system. And uh, we found out many years ago that those kids frequently, one of the things they most needed was shoes. We also found out that they didn't have belts, and when they moved from one foster family to the other where they frequently did it in a trash bag, that didn't seem all that good. So we collect now duffel bags, backpacks, uh, belts, and shoes. Uh, we'll call the CPS people on after Palm Sunday and we'll get them to them and they will uh, distribute them. Hopefully a bunch of kids will have new to them shoes on Easter. They don't have to be brand new. Uh, they just need to be good and usable. And, uh, and if you're asking, if you're thinking what sizes, well, these kids come in all sizes. Uh, I remember uh, a friend of mine was doing some work with the CPS kids here in town, and he was looking for a belt that was a 48. Uh, so you, you think, well, you know, you don't know what size. Any size is okay because they'll make use of it. Uh, we've started a tradition this recently of starting our service. You don't need to remain. You don't, don't need to stand. We're just going to sing together. Surely the presence of the Lord. We'll sing it through a couple of times.
And you may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel. It's in chapter 16, is the first 13 verses. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him for being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, Well, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will allow, it will, I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably? I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's appointed is now before the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him, for the Lord does not see his mortal seed. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jason, Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, Well, there remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send him, bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. <coughs> now he was ruddy, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, this morning we will revert, if you will, to the uh, Nicene Creed as we affirm our faith. As you're able, would you stand as we affirm ourselves with the Nicene Creed? Together, friends, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, He was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I'll be inviting the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. 
besides the offering of shoes that we're doing this year, we still continue to have our blessing box. And so as you're out doing your grocery shopping, if you can pick up a few extra cans, uh, it's been a little, a little empty over the last week or two, so we could do well to stock that up just a little bit. It's one of the great things I think we do for our community that, uh, that I think they appreciate and obviously use regularly. Let me invite the ushers to come forward now for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Let's pray. Great God of heaven, we thank you for all of our blessings. For a warm place to worship on Sunday morning, for a community that's in all relativity safe, for family and friends. For a great country and great neighborhoods in which we live. We ask you to bless our tithes and our offerings and givings. So that whatever we give goes to glorify you in this community and throughout the world. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. <laughs> And you may remain seated as we sing, Spirit of the Living God. our great joy to be able to pray together 
Join me in a few moments of silence as we begin our prayer time today. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you humbly, imperfect, broken. In so many ways, not aware of your presence in our surroundings, in our relationships. We read things like the Creed and we remember that over the years we've learned to not only depend on God, our Creator, or Jesus, our King, but the Holy Spirit who helps us to understand the Scriptures and it becomes evident to our lives through the things that we do and sometimes don't do. Today we lift up prayers for our community. Many are still suffering from the damage of that tornado back in January. People are displaced and inconvenienced. Those kinds of suffering are clear and evident. But the silent suffering that goes on behind people's eyes and their minds. That suffering sometimes we don't see. So many times we are blinded by what we think we see that we miss the opportunity to see what we can see. We read the scripture about the selection of the king and we realize it wasn't about beauty or height or stature. It was about David's heart. And as we go through our lives, we are also selected by our hearts to be the people that God calls us to be. Of course, we pray for peace. And personally, I pray for every single church in our community to be filled to the brim. And we pray for healing. And sometimes we prevent, forget to pray for those that we don't see. Those people that find a way when we're not working here at the church to come by the food box because they don't want to be noticed. Those people struggling to improve their house or live in a better place. Those people trying to transform their lives after maybe having made mistakes in their life. We forget sometimes that dear by the grace of God go each of us. So God help us. Help us to have the heart and the eyes of Jesus who saw the woman at the well as something more than just a woman that couldn't do anything, but a woman that eventually helped transform the whole city. Maybe God is seeing us that way too. If we open our eyes and our ears to find a way to reach out to those people that don't yet know you. That don't know that you're the King of Kings. Don't know what a difference it makes to have you in their life. God, help us not to preach at them, but to be transformative. Not to tell them the bads of their ways, but to show them the goodness of life with you. So many of the stories, especially as we get close to Easter, we see here about you transforming the lives of people around you. And so today, as we pray the prayer you taught us, we pray for that same transformation. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we'll be reading the scripture from the Gospel of John, so if you're, if you're willing and able, would you stand as we sing Because He Lives and remain standing for the reading. The Gospel of John, chapter 9. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sent this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others kept saying, no, but it's someone like him. 
He kept saying, I'm the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. When I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received the sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who's a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about it? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He's of age. Ask him. For the second time, they called the man who had been blind. They said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he's a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciple? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins. And are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You've seen him. And the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment. So those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we're not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. <coughs> This is a dramatic miracle. It symbolizes conversion. Demonstrates the division that conversion can cause. The blind man wants healed, progressively recognizes Jesus' true identity from name to prophet to Messiah. While others just remain curious, some of them even hostile. Wesley said about spiritual blindness, the consequence of Jesus' coming will be that by the just judgment of God, while the blind in body and soul receive their sight, 
those who they who boast they see will be given up to still greater blindness than before. Sometimes we in the church decide what you're supposed to see. I'm not saying we should do that. It's just sometimes we do that. Sometimes we make it clear that we want you to see certain things. This scripture makes it clear to me that we need to be more blinded in order to be open to the Spirit and open to what God has to offer. I mean, we know that people that are without sight develop extra you know, sensory abilities. So many times the people of the church, the religious people, the Pharisees in this case, they think they've got it figured out. You got to do it my way. You got to do it to honor God the way I honor God. And so many times it works all the way back like into that first Samuel passage that we read where what God wants has nothing to do with how we look or what we say or where we go. So many times we in the church have become judgmental about people because of their, their uh, social status, because of their racial status, because of their class. Other times it's simply because of the way they live, what their lifestyle is like, the clothes they wear, the way they act. Two clear messages here are that we need to blind ourselves to that and use the heart vision that God gives us to reach in and see who people really are. Or maybe we need to look and see who we really are. We're not often what we think we are. Many times we look in the mirror and we and there's two passages that always ring true for me on this. One of them is the guy it is in the letter of James where he says we look in a mirror and we see who we are and then we turn away from the mirror and we forget. And the Apostle Paul says, we remember those things from the past, but he says, forgetting those things in the line of the past, we press forward to the mark or the goal, whichever version you're reading. Friends, we don't have to let our past define us. Maybe we haven't always been friendly or loving or kind. Maybe we've made mistakes. Maybe we've had a lifestyle that others look down on. Whatever was, was, because the only thing that matters now is where we're going, not where we've been. But you know that past can become a burden. In some ways it becomes a burden like it was on this blind guy. He was a beggar. And suddenly there was this transformation in him. He was now, a, they describe him as a young man, no longer a beggar. He's, they're having questions about who is he? Could it even be the same guy? I wonder, as we're brought to sight in a spiritual way, if maybe we would find that kind of a transformation in our own lives. If maybe we would find that if we just would let go and let God determine who we are and where we're going, we might find ourselves on an entirely different path with different relationships, different people around us, and reaching out to people we thought we'd never be able to talk to before. Maybe there's a message here for us about how the church can become an institution like the Pharisees had that says, oh, he was a sinner because he did it on the Sabbath. The good news for us is that they were divided. They weren't all there. The whole world isn't on the same plan. We know that there's a lot of Christians in the world that care and love and have mercy and grace. But boy, I'll tell you what, some days when you look out at the world we're living in, it's hard to find them. It's like we're really good at that when we're here. We can, we can be in church and we can be loving and kind and we can say, we're going to welcome anybody. But when the rubber meets the road, sometimes it's kind of tough. My colleague, Rudy Rasmus, is the pastor at St. John's United Methodist Church downtown. It's kind of right under the Pierce Elevated. About 8,000 members, last I heard. Some years ago, and they've done it more than once, but some years ago, 
they were having the either the All-Star Game or the Super Bowl or something. The city of Houston didn't want anybody to see on the news that we had homeless people, and so they offered them some money to go to hotels and places to stay. And Rudy told them to come down and stay on the church property, which is right down there where everybody has to go. On Sunday morning at Rudy's church, you might see a lawyer dressed in fine clothes sitting next to a homeless guy who by the end of the service may have his head on the lawyer's shoulder sleeping. I know I see some of that here too, but it's okay. <laughs> Diversity is what really the church is about, I think. Not about reaching people that look just like we look, even think just like we think or act just like we think what would it be like to have people that that had a different lifestyle than us that maybe would show us some different stuff i i know that uh, some years ago when i wrote a paper about uh, a friend of mine his name is leonard freeman he's about my age grew up he's african-american he grew up and we spent several hours together i was having to write a paper about him for my for seminary and you know, after several hours together, we discovered that our lives were more similar than they were dissimilar. Now, granted, on holidays, they ate a little different food than we did. But you know, his grandma how, knew how to get a switch off of a bush in the backyard and strip the leaves off and whip him with it just like mine did. <laughs> I mean, really, we had a lot more similarities than we had differences, but so many times we spent so much time on the differences that we can't ever grasp the similarities. And I think that's, that's really the, the word that comes to me out of this, is this whole notion of blindness. If you can't see, then look. And if you think you see, realize that you don't see what you think you see. So many times, I think it was Mark Twain that said, you never really never, and he used old language because he lived a long time ago, you never know a man. No, I get it wrong. <coughs> anyway, basically, it was uh, the better you get to know somebody, the more you, you like them. And sometimes we get into that place where we just decide immediately up front, I'm not going to like those. I told you all the story a while back about when I applied for a job with a with a uh, pharmaceutical company that sold veterinary flood of stuff, and I made it all the way to the final interview, and they said. They said, uh, what kind of community activities do you do? I said, well, I do Boy Scouts with my kids, do church. I do Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, what's that? I said, it's a group of people that get together to get sober. He said, so you had a drinking problem? I said, the, the key word is had. And he said, well, we don't hire drunks. You're excused. I mean, really, how many times do we make those kind of judgments based on something like that? I mean, I ride a motorcycle on occasion. And when I do, I know that there are people that are saying, kids, stay away from those people. They're those thugs that ride motorcycles. Do I really look like a thug? No. <laughs> I mean, I, and nothing about me makes thug. Whip, maybe, but not thug. <laughs> Especially if it falls over, I can't even pick it up. <laughs> Me and three other people might pick it up. So when I read through this story about the blind guy, I wonder if I can put myself into the same place and think about my first theological understanding was of a God that would be there when I got to heaven. Oh, I prayed to him. I know I've told you this before, too. I prayed every night. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. I didn't like that phrase that said, if I die before I wake, so I changed it. I don't remember what I said right now, but I anyway, I changed it. I didn't want to say that. Never mind. And then there came a time when I started to understand that God was more than that, that, that God was this, this presence in life that when you make good decisions, God can make them even better decisions, and when you make bad decisions, God can maybe confront you a little bit with it. Sometimes that happens with the police when you're speeding, or but you find ways to be confronted to straighten out your way. A 
I taught Sunday school. I taught the senior highs. I always felt like I needed to study a little bit, at least a little bit, so I'd be 10 or 15 minutes ahead of them in their understanding about it. And you know, I want to tell you, the more you study this book, the more God's going to get into you. And you know, you're going to find that if you read this scripture today, you may be able to open ways that you've been blind to the world. You may read it again in six weeks. It may mean something entirely different to you. Before I ever went to seminary, I knew that I needed help on my Bible because I hadn't studied it very closely. I worked really hard in my Old Testament and New Testament classes to understand what God was doing. September of 2001, my dad died. My mother called me and said he had fallen. I went over to the house. I lived in Deer Park. It's about five miles. I made it faster than the ambulance did coming from Bayshore. It's about three in the morning. Went in the house. Mom told me he was in the bathroom. She couldn't get him up. And I went in there and he had died. And it literally was a time when I became open to understanding or blind to some things that I knew that all that stuff those Sunday school teachers and choir directors and other people had taught me was true, that my dad was gone. Even though I could look at his body crumpled up on the floor. The EMT guys came down the hall and so said, you want us to revive him? I said, no. He's got prostate cancer. He's in pain every day. He's having chemotherapy and radiation every day. Why would we revive him for that when he's gone to be with God? For me, that was like this guy washing in the pool of Siloam. I knew who was taking care of my dad. I had to walk around the corner and tell mom. Mm. She took it okay. And then she was mom. She said, well, don't we need to go cover him up? I said, no, he's fine. And I just shut the door until the funeral home could get there. I knew he wasn't there. I knew then that there is something more than what we see in front of us there. And I knew that he was fine. He had been healed. He was transformed. And I know that we can get that same transformation in our lives now. We don't have to wait until we die to get it. Amen. Oh, man. And I know that transformation is possible because it has worked on me. I'm not transformed as far as I want to be, but I'm transformed from what I used to be. And if you've never experienced that transformation, then that may be because we think we can see what it looks like. Maybe it's time we got blind. Maybe it's time we got ready for God to work on us without us telling God what we need. What order we want it in. When it's supposed to happen. And trust that God does have a plan and we can be a part of it. It's funny how we kind of are like those people in the old days. They said, well, that guy must have really sinned if he's blind. They, that wasn't really necessarily a, a, a judgment of his health. It was an understanding of a theological difference. He wasn't close to God the way Jesus is telling the story. It's not really about the fact that he couldn't see. It's about the fact that his life did not include God at all. He was blind to it. And he, out of no nothing, he did nothing anywhere. Jesus comes up to him. And begins the transformation process. I just wonder, friends, you know, those of you with us on Facebook too, I just wonder. Have there, have there been times when Jesus came up to you and said, Do you want to see? It might have been those, not those words, but, but do you want to see? Do you want the vast understanding of the spiritual comfort of life with Jesus Christ revealed to you? And how many times we may have turned our head and said, It's inconvenient right now the mystery of how Jesus Christ works the mystery of his life of his relationships 
in comparison to the, the, the Pharisees of the synagogue who knew they had it right and you had to sacrifice at the right time at the right day for the right thing to make the right cause. You've got to put it right in their face when he goes on the Sabbath. Spits on the ground, makes some mud. And changes a person's life. I want to tell you, friends, I believe that same opportunity is available for all of us. I think Jesus is just looking for that time to catch us at that time when He can do that same thing. Spit on the ground, make some mud, put it on our eyes, and open us up to the incredible power of life in Jesus Christ. But really the big question is, will we be blind enough to get it? It's really kind of funny when you say it the other way. What Jesus is really saying is if you're blind, you haven't sinned, there's an opportunity for me to work with you. If you're not blind, then you can see your sin. So become blind. Become blind. And let God change you. Just like He's changing us from winter to spring. Sort of. Things will be 36 tomorrow. You can see God's transformation all around, friends. Why wouldn't that? Why shouldn't that? Why doesn't that include us? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So if we're willing to be blind, then maybe we're willing to sing this next song in a little bit different way. As you're able, would you stand as we read? Today's a, as we close our hymn, this would be the day that you and I church, with our church come forward as we sing. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice.
friends out on Facebook, thank you for joining us today. We do worship here at 11 every Sunday and 5.30 every Saturday night. We would invite you to come and join with us. Friends here in the church realize that God, the Creator, is transforming the world from winter to spring. We can see it. Jesus is showing us how to walk through that transformation. But the Holy Spirit will help us do it. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.